Welcome to another session of SEO ZAS webinar. It's another virtual session of our uh, former conference. It was uh, probably the largest SEO conference in Central Europe. And uh, today, uh, my name is Daniel Durish, and I'm from uh, Basta Digital, uh, digital marketing agency based in Slovakia. And uh, today, our guest is Lily Ray and she's a head of organic search in uh, MCV Digital or organic research. Sorry about that at MCV Digital. And she's joining us from Brooklyn, uh, New York. And today our uh, main focus will be on Google algorithm called EAT or EAT for short. And uh, um, welcome, Lily. Thanks so much. And uh, so we are going to talk today about expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness, and uh, how this algorithm that has been introduced, that was introduced in what, 2019, 2018? I think Google first started talking about it in 2014, actually. Ah, 2014. Okay, cool. And uh, it's it's the algorithm or page quality um, factor. Uh, that's that influences content ranking and pages ranking all right so we have also a uh, place for your questions and that is on slido so you can join us on slido.com just enter the seo code or the event code seo us and or you can also scan the qr code on your screen and join, join us through your mobile phones and feel free to ask any questions uh, already in the meantime while Lily is presenting. And uh, Lily, the floor is yours. Please uh, share your screen and you can start with your presentation. Awesome, sounds great. So I will be talking about the state of EAT in 2022. And again, my name is Lily Ray. I'm the Senior Director of SEO and Head of Organic Research at a digital marketing agency called Amps of Digital, uh, based here in New York City. And if you've heard me speak before or read any of my articles or just in general, if you've been paying attention to what's happening on Google in the last few years, I think that EAT is becoming the predominant factor that Google's looking at for many different types of queries, many different types of sites. And I think it's actually becoming more important than a lot of the different ranking factors that we think about on a day-to-day -day basis in the SEO space. So just to take a step back, uh, what is EAT? So EAT stands for expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. It's a definition that Google created that it first started using in its search quality evaluator guidelines. And this is a, a document that Google uses to train uh, human search quality evaluators who are actual human beings who they conduct experiments with to basically uh, evaluate whether Google's results are meeting the quality expectation that Google lays out in these, these guidelines. So throughout the search quality guidelines, Google uses EAT to describe uh, pages that have expertise, authority, and trust, both in terms of the people that are producing the content, the website or the brand itself, and just the, the experience of like how trustworthy it is to actually, you know, buy a product on that website or get content from that website. So it's, again, it's an, it's an acronym that's used in the search quality evaluator guidelines, but it informs future algorithm updates and what Google's hoping to achieve with elevating good quality content. Google's used EAT as one of the most important factors for achieving SEO performance in the last few years. So it's not just the search quality guidelines, it's actually a lot of different Google documents where they talk about the importance of EAT. So uh, to start, they if you wanna learn SEO, Google says in its actual SEO starter guide on the Google website, that you should cultivate a reputation for expertise and trustworthiness in a specific area and also that expertise and authoritativeness of a site can increase its quality. If you want to improve a performance during a core update, so right now we actually just finished the September 2022 core update. Google rolls out several core updates each year and they have one article that they always show link back to in terms of what you should do about a core update. And what Danny Sullivan says in that article is that you should get to know the quality reader guidelines as well as EAT. If you wanna rank in Google News or Google Discover, uh, EAT is also very important. So in another article where Google talks about how to rank in Google Discover and Google News, they say that you need to make sure you're regularly producing original news content that's high in expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. 
we have a new set of updates rolling out uh, with English content called the product review updates, where we've actually just had five of them. The last one just finished a couple of days ago. And this is Alan Kent from Google who oversees those updates. And he says that you should express expert knowledge about products where appropriate. So we can start to see that EAT is playing a role in product review updates as well. And obviously Google owns YouTube. So it's not just Google search where EAT is becoming important, but YouTube is also looking a lot at EAT. So if you read Google, uh, YouTube's documentation, there's a section about how YouTube addresses misinformation. And they say that we use machine learning systems that prioritize information from authoritative sources. And there's a variety of different in initiatives that YouTube has been doing to elevate good EAT videos as well. And a lot of people have been asking Google for more information about EAT over the past few years. Uh, this was a video that Danny Sullivan did specifically for Google News Publishers. And somebody asked, how does Google determine who is an authority on a topic? And Danny says, number one, we can understand how authoritative an article seems to be. And then something that I thought was very important that Danny said is that we understand broad notions of topics. And if a site has uh, a history of authoritative content on a particular topic, it might do well in those areas. So I actually think this is Google saying, if your website or your subdomain or you know, your brand is really focused in one specific area and you demonstrate authority in that one area, it's likely that you're gonna be able to rank better for those keywords than areas where your site doesn't demonstrate any EAT. Google's also said throughout the years that EAT matters more for what they call your money or your life content. So in the past, Google defined your money or your life as content that can affect people's health, their safety, their finances, um, politics content, news content, any content that really has a big impact on people's life and their safety. But this year, Google changed the search quality evaluator guidelines, and it also changed the definition of your money or your life. So it's hard to, to, to kind of summarize everything that they changed because it, it spans like 10 different pages of the search quality guidelines, and it's a very nuanced definition. In fact, they actually built this table, which you can look at in the search quality guidelines, which shows many different examples of what it means to be your money or your life content. So I would encourage you to look at this table. This is in Google search quality guidelines, which you can find online. But basically what they're saying is that content is defined as your money or your life if it has the ability to cause harm to users. So whether that's physical harm or whether that's um, you know, misinformation or fake news or something that could cause somebody to be violent or harass people or anything like that, anything that can cause damage to an individual or to society is going to be treated as your money or your life. So the more your money, your life, your content is, the more that EAT is going to matter for your SEO strategy. Google has also said that EAT matters more during times of crisis. So they've specifically said on record a few times, we design our systems to elevate authoritative content over factors like recency or exact match wording of titles when a crisis is developing. So during COVID, we saw this a lot. Um, a lot of the most authoritative websites on the internet, like the UN, the CDC, the World Health Organization, they ranked for a lot of different keywords because Google really wanted to make sure that users saw the most authoritative, trustworthy content and not just content from any random person talking about coronavirus. And most recently, this was data that was pulled yesterday, um, Google has been launching various core updates. We just finished the September 22 core update. And something that I've noticed, and I'm doing this analysis now, is that a lot of these dot government sites are seeing big increases. So these are different sites that come directly from the government, and they're providing a lot of information about financial issues, health issues, you know, taxes, things like that. And they're earning very top positions above people who might be writing about these topics who aren't actually government entities. So this is an example of how authority actually plays into SEO performance. Google has also made some big changes to how the search results look. So there's a new feature called about this result. And if you click on the three dots next to any organic result, you get this pop-up that's called about this result. It's gonna tell you who the brand is. If they have a Wikipedia profile, it's gonna pull in information from there. It's gonna tell you why Google chose that result, how long that site has been indexed on Google. So this is a good example of what Google's doing to convey 
like transparency to the user and why the user should be able to trust Google's algorithms. Google also is testing a new feature called highly cited. So for a top stories result or a news result, if a lot of other publishers are linking back to that piece of content or referencing that piece of content, Google is going to put this label that says highly cited, which means that they're showing the user which is the piece of news that's responsible for like breaking the news, providing original research, original reporting. And Google has actually said in 2019, they have this article that's all about, we're going to try to rank original reporting higher in search as opposed to everybody else that's just writing about the same thing. And maybe they're all referencing that one piece of content. So this is another example of why doing the research, doing the work, breaking the news is something that can really help with your SEO strategy. Another example of how I think EAT is uh, playing into the search results is that I believe Google's getting a lot better at understanding who authors are. So this was an interesting example where there's this great SEO professional named Brody Clark. And if you Googled Brody Clark's name, you get two different results. Number one, you get on the in the knowledge panel. This is a man named Brody Clark. He's a British civil servant. This is not the same Brody Clark as SEO Brody Clark, but he's ranking in the knowledge panel. But at the same time, Google had this other carousel for articles where they're showing all this different content that SEO Brody has written. So to me, this shows that Google's getting better at understanding who authors are and introducing different SERP features to like illuminate what, what SEO Brody is doing or what this other Brody is doing. But there's been a variety of different new features this year where Google's actually highlighting individual authors. So this is another example of why it's important to include author information in your articles and then an author biography as well. And a big trend in SEO over the past few years is that the rise of real authorities uh, in SEO performance is becoming like a really, really big uh, change over the past few years. So if you look starting in like 2016, this is when Google really started to focus on fake news and misinformation. Um, we had some pretty major presidential elections here in the US that caused Google to make a big change to it, its algorithms essentially. And you can see over the past few years, and even most recently with the September core update, um, actually really in 2022, you're seeing the Cleveland Clinic, the Mayo Clinic, the CDC, FDA, Medline Plus, which is a government institution and the National Health, uh, National Health Services, I believe. These are all uh, either government sites, universities or institutions that are highly trusted, medical institutions. And they're starting to outrank a lot of different sites that are trying to rank for different medical topics. And another example of a site that's doing SEO and EAT really well is called the Keto uh, or the Diet Doctor. And they have a lot of different pages for the keto diet. And what I love about this site is that they show all these different um, you know, evidence-based, who wrote the content, who reviewed the content, key takeaways from the content, um, really easy to navigate. There's all these different links that show where they got the content from. And if you wanna look at a site that's doing EAT very well, this is dietdoctor.com, really fantastic site. Um, also think about putting, you know, how much you trust the content that you're, you're getting your information from, where are all the references and resources that you're getting your information from, everything you can do to provide transparency to the user is going to be good for EAT. So obviously EAT has become extremely important for SEO in the last few years. And one way that we see this play out is through Google's core updates. So about three to four times per year, Google launches these really big broad core updates. Um, we have other types of updates as well. We just had the helpful content update. We have product review updates. We have spam updates and link updates. There's actually thousands of algorithm updates every year, but the broad core updates are the ones where Google has been, you know, taking a lot of data and feedback and user experience and all these things into consideration for a long time. And they unleash a new set of algorithms that they try to do, you know, show better content or content that has better EAT. So this is what we just experienced over the last few weeks. We had the September core update. And I believe that EAT is always a big factor that they're looking at with these updates. And what I'm doing right now and what I'll be doing, you know, later this week is publishing an article that talks about what I think happened with this last core update. But with almost all the core updates of the past few years, it's pretty clear that EAT plays a big role 
Um, this is just a view of how many different types of updates we have. Each of these blue letters is, a, is an algorithm update, a big confirmed algorithm update by Google. Um, I couldn't even fit the new ones on the slide. So we have the new September product review update, as well as the helpful content update and the core update, which all just finished rolling out a couple of days ago. So it's always busy on Google. And honestly, it's becoming harder and harder to analyze what happened with each individual update because Google is now rolling a lot of them out at the same time, which makes things very confusing. But one big trend is that Google is starting to lean into real expertise. So, you know, one thing you can notice throughout a lot of these different documents when Google talks about these updates is that they're really interested in elevating content that's written by real experts or enthusiasts. And my theory is that Google's getting a lot better at algorithmically understanding who's a real expert and who's somebody who is just saying the same thing that everybody else said. In the product review updates, Google talks about the importance of expertise. They want to rank product reviews that show that somebody's an actual expert, that somebody actually tested the products. They even want uh, pictures and videos of the person using the products. And I think that this is common between the core updates and the product review updates. Google wants evidence that you are someone that they can trust who's a real expert. These are some examples of sites that have seen increases with the product review updates. And if you look at these pages, um, there's all kinds of proof that the person that reviewed these earplugs or the indoor outdoor thermometers, like first they're saying who they are, when they published this content, how much time they spent reviewing the content. Um, you know, our product recommendations are updated weekly. All this evidence that shows that they actually received the products, spent time with the products, tested the products, because the problem that Google's having is there's too many sites that are saying that they're reviewing products, but they're actually not. And they're just putting affiliate links on the page and making money. So Google's very interested right now in real evidence that you actually did the work of testing all your products. And this has also led to what I think is a really big trend in SEO, which is the rise of real subject matter experts. This is a new way of thinking about SEO, which is basically incorporating true experts into your SEO strategy, into your content strategy, which isn't always the easiest thing, but I think it's the type of strategy that helps to get great results long-term. So this year I've been looking for a lot of different examples of experts that are doing very well with SEO. And these are some examples of either um, content contributors or people that own online businesses or run online businesses. But what's interesting about all of them is that they have another job, another thing that they're an expert in. So actually before they started writing content, you know, before they started blogging or whatever they're doing, they do something else. So um, they're all seeing really big increases on their sites in terms of SEO traffic and visibility over the past couple of years. But these people like Reed Drummond is a chef, for example, or she, she likes to cook and write about cooking. Um, Zachary Smith runs a pest control company. He's somebody that like literally goes into people's homes and helps them get rid of mice and rodents and cockroaches and things like that. So they're publishing content online, but they're actually experts in other areas. So what do all of these winning sites have in common? Uh, one thing that's interesting about all of them is that their whole website focuses on one niche. Google's talked a lot about this in the past couple of years. They're interested in seeing sites demonstrate authoritativeness in one particular area. That's not to say that you can't have a site that does talk about a few different topics, but more and more, if your site talks about too many different things, like you can't be an expert in medical recommendations and financial recommendations at the same time. Like it's very few sites that can do that. These experts have one site that's dedicated to one area where they demonstrate real expertise. They always have an about me or about us page where they talk a lot about the brand, who they are, why they're experts, why you can trust them, how long they've been doing that job, etc. The articles are always written with firsthand experience or expertise. So a lot of them are written in the first person and they just talk about who they are, why you can trust them and the things that they experience day to day in their jobs. They have transparent authorship, so they always mention who wrote the article. And if one of the experts didn't actually write the article, in many cases, they reviewed the article and they still have their name on the page. They always back up their expertise with evidence, anecdotes, and experiences. So if you read the content, they're always going to say, like, you know, when I help 
families get rid of mice in their homes. These are the different things that I experience in the job. And here's some pictures of the mice that I found. So it's like real evidence that they've actually been doing the work. Uh, they're always objective with their advice. So they're not trying to push their products or services on people. So, you know, in the example of getting rid of mice in your home, they might have an article that says, here's all the different ways that you can do this yourself without calling a professional because they're not always trying to sell a product. In many cases, they're just trying to provide really helpful information online. And I think Google's very interested in that type of content. In terms of linking, people are always very concerned about linking. Um, I always recommend for EAT, like you should always link out to any place that you're getting your information from, of course. But what's interesting about these experts is that they often don't need to link out to other sources because they're the ones that are providing the original information. So many other websites are linking to them because they're the ones that provide the real value and the real expert opinion. So it's, you know, it's an interesting way of thinking about link building. If you're the one that's providing the true information that nobody else has seen before, people are going to link to you because you're the real expert. And then again, for product reviews, there's always evidence that they've conducted extensive testing. And then for, uh, you know, in terms of which content they talk about, there's always a robust coverage of all the different questions people might be asking about their area of expertise. And they basically answer all those different questions on their sites. So what does this actually look like? Here's a few examples of some of these experts that I've been talking about. Um, this is a company called Smith's Pest Control. This is the man that runs the company named Zach Smith. On every page, there's a biography for Zach Smith. They rank number one for how to get rid of cockroaches. They talk about things that you should avoid in your home. Um, he's very qualified to write the article. He's a real expert. He talks about firsthand experience, pros and cons, step-by-step -step guidance. And it's just a very helpful article. It's very honest based on his real expertise. This is a travel blogger named Renee Roaming and she ranks number one for Road Trip Utah. And what I love about her article is she starts by saying, I've visited each of these national parks numerous times. My husband and I visit all the national parks. Uh, I know a little bit about this because I've been to all these places. She includes photography of her own trips there. She has detailed recommendations for different types of trips and, and apps that she uses and weather recommendations. And it's like very obvious that she's actually spent a lot of time there. Um, Bob Vila is another site that does really well over the past few years. Um, he's a famous home contractor. He ranks number one for a lot of different keywords. He helps write the content with other people at the company. And, you know, what he does well is talks about how to work with a contractor, explains everything with firsthand experience. He talks about expected costs of different projects. So he doesn't just say, this is going to cost you a lot of money. He actually gives prices. And again, they're always mentioning who the real authors are. This is a woman uh, named Charlotte, who's a real beekeeper. She has a beekeeping website called Carolina Honeybees. She won an award for being the beekeeper of the year. She's always talking about like, why is the queen bee bigger? And you can see here, she's not linking to anybody else. She's just providing information that she actually knows because she's somebody who's an expert in this field. So a lot of other people who might talk about beekeeping are going to link to her content. This is a company that does um, insulation or foam insulation for walls. They list all of the different experts that work at their company. They have a whole video strategy that talks about different ways to uh, get to know the people at the company and you know best insulation for exterior walls. They have a whole YouTube account that talks about <laughs> insulation and foam. And what's really interesting about this site is that if you type how to get spray foam off your hands, you're going to see the website ranking in, in the featured snippet, but you're also going to see their YouTube account ranking in videos. And I think that this is Google saying, we know that this company has EAT both in search as well as YouTube. So EAT can potentially transfer across different Google products. So a few different ways that you can analyze your site's expertise. The First thing that I would recommend doing is get a good understanding of where your site does well on a category, subcategory, and tag basis. So you can use your websites, you know, if you have subfolders, if you have breadcrumbs, if you have categories, tags, try to extract those from your content and cross-reference that with Search Console data, Google Analytics data. You can use a tool like Screaming Frog to 
pull, extract different elements off the page. So your author's name, uh, the date that it was updated, summary of the content. You can take all these different attributes, extract that using something like Screaming Frog to do custom extract and just get an understanding of where does my site do well? So this is a client where they were really declining for health keywords, fitness keywords, but they did great for like sex and love and, and relationship keywords. And so you can start to see, maybe Google thinks we have EAT on these topics, but not on these other topics. And we should write more about the content that Google thinks we do have good EAT and maybe not write as many articles in the areas where we don't demonstrate good EAT. You can also work with internal experts and build out their SEO presence as a personal brand. So if your company has any real experts, if you're a local business that has a real expert, um, you want to include that person's information on your website. This is a website in Spanish that I look at that I think does a really good job. So it's a doctor website. They list all these different doctors. They talk about areas where they're an expert. They have videos of the doctors. You can actually have an appointment with that doctor. And what's very interesting about it is when you Google the doctor's name, you can see this website called Top Doctors. His personal page is ranking with star ratings and all these different things. So you can tell the doctor, if you're working with this doctor, I wanna help you rank number one or you know number five for your name. And then your website gets that traffic for that person's name. So it's actually an SEO strategy. You should always provide thorough, clear, and consistent author and expert biographies and use consistent biography language across websites. So I have a bio that I use on my website, on my company's website, on all the different places that I speak. And if you type who is Lily Ray, Google's going to pull in that bio. This helps Google understand, oh, this is the same person that we're seeing speak across all these different areas. So we understand that this is a real expert because we're seeing that bio appear across many different sites. Um, always provide original research and original opinions. Don't just rehash or state the same thing that other people have written. If your experts have done video content or podcast content, make sure that you're transcribing that as text. You can make blog articles out of that expert content. You can reach out to experts and ask for contributions. Um, you can invite experts to contribute content on your site. Anything that allows the expert's voice to be part of your content strategy. So some questions that you can ask your clients. Who are the real experts that work at your company? And how can we involve those people in our SEO strategy? What role can the experts play in our content strategy? So maybe you can send them a series of questions that they can answer and you can use their answers in your blogs. Uh, what knowledge actually makes your brand a real expert compared to the other competitors that you might be going against? What is the unique angle that can set your content apart? You know, what's something that you can say in your content that hasn't already been said on a lot of different sites? And what value can you provide in your content that can't be found in an SEO tool? So in the SEO space, a lot of us are using the same tools a lot of us have access to the same keyword research. What Google's looking for now is somebody that's introducing something new to the conversation that's not just saying the same thing that everybody else wrote. So my team and I are very focused on EAT. We're very focused on these types of strategies. And this is an example of a client that we worked on that was hit really heavily by the medic update in 2018. That was August 1st of 2018. We lost a lot of SEO visibility. They started focusing on EAT around here. They launched a brand new EAT focused website, they saw a really big increase. And then with two different core updates, they started to see really big increases as well. So it takes a really long time, but focusing on the right things can get you, uh, you know, recovered from core updates or just, you'll see a great increase in, in traffic and visibility over time. So we'll stop there and open it up to questions. Uh, thank you, Lily. Very informative uh, presentation. And also I appreciate all the examples that you thrown welcome. in. Um, we, I, I think we have a couple of questions. So in a, in a short time, we should switch to Slido and see that. Uh, in the meantime, I have a question maybe regarding something that, that you haven't talked about, but is it that, do you think that EAT or how, how successful do you think that EAT uh, was or has been successful in dealing with, uh, for example, misinformation and, and, and uh, regarding pandemic or even other topics like poli politics. Do you think this helps to um, move up or increase ranking of actually authoritative websites? Because we know that 
even some websites that we can, uh, for example, label as mis being misinformative, uh, could be could be seen as authoritative in their field. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think so. I mostly look at U.S. rankings and performance, so I can't speak for the whole world. I think that uh, Google did probably isn't doing as well in other countries and other languages as they are in the U.S. But I do think that in the U.S., Google has done a very good job of. Uh, eliminating the visibility of most fake news, especially compared to other social media sites that aren't doing as good of a job. Um, actually, I think that Google probably went a little bit too far in the last few years. So there's a lot of sites that aren't necessarily fake news that lost all SEO visibility because Google's like leaning so heavily on government websites and trustworthy websites. So I do think they've done a good job. I do think it's very difficult to find fake news on Google most of the time. Um, but again, I can't speak for the other countries. So, and also that's, that's like, there's people that have different political views, right? So there's certain people right, that right, think right. like Google's doing a terrible job, but it depends what your political views are. Right. Um, yeah. Right. So it's complicated, but yeah. Yeah. But I think now, now also based on your presentation, we have seen some preference for actually government and official sources also during yes. pandemic, I think in the beginning, it started that they were uh labeling the official sources right so with uh, some some labels and so on all right okay so um let's skip to the questions of our participants for example how do i provide google with authoritative references supporting my content is there some way to do it easily and we can maybe join it with another question and that's it is it, do you recommend to collaborate with experts on some type of content or all content? How do you see that? Yeah, I, I so again, it, it matters more depending on what type of content you're writing about. So if it's something that Google considers your money or your life, if it can affect somebody's safety or their well-being or their health, like, yes, you should always focus a lot on EAT and authoritativeness. So like, make sure that you're citing or linking to authoritative sources. Um, if you're ever providing like a statistic, you should always say where you got that statistic. You should interview people like doctors or experts and include that in your content. And don't write about things where you don't have actual like facts because it's very hard to rank and it can make your whole site not look good. Okay. Uh, what about rich snippets? Uh, we have different kinds of rich snippets. Uh, also, there are some for articles, there are some for other type of content. Do they actually help with the trustworthiness? It's a good question. I don't think that uh, rich, I don't think that Google sees rich snippets as a way to trust your site necessarily because so many SEO people put <laughs> structured data on their sites. But I do think like it can help with users trusting your site if you have good star ratings, for example. Um, but it's also worth noting that you should never use rich snippets as a way to like try to cheat or provide um, be like too salesy. Like if you try to like if like put your phone number in an FAQ schema or something like Google hates that you can actually get manual actions for that. So it can it can count against your trustworthiness with Google. And then there's also certain categories where Google might not show rich snippets at all. Um, so basically, like if you're in like drug rehab, for example, we've seen some clients where they can't get rich snippets at all. Okay. Um, okay, let's talk about product reviews. You have mentioned it also in your presentation. There are two questions basically asking similar thing. And that is, for example, bro okay, one is broad product review site. So basically a site that reviews anything and everything, I guess. Uh, is there yeah how do you how do you provide expertise in in this case is it is it that you need to have actual images and videos taken by you or by your collaborators or is there any other way so google itself is the one that said you should include videos and and pictures of you using it like there's definitely many sites out there that are doing fine that aren't doing those things but it's becoming harder and harder so like you have to think about a future where you are providing evidence. Um, right. Too many sites have gotten away for too long with just like saying that they're reviewing products without having real expertise. So I would say if you're in that, if that's something that's affecting your content strategy, I would figure out with your team 
how can we prove that we're actually using these products instead of just saying it? Like I found a site yesterday that's been negatively impacted by the product review update. And they said, we tried on 20,000 wigs when writing this article. And it's like, did you really do that? Or are you just saying that? Because that's kind of hard to believe. So just think about this as a future way to like, you know, improve your content strategy. Right. And in terms of maybe generating or publishing customer reviews, so content that hasn't been reviewed by somebody or is not really authoritative from, from point of Google because it's been written by somebody random who maybe uh, purchased the product. Do you think yeah. this EAT also affects uh, e-commerce websites in terms of they should be maybe uh, checking what kind of customer reviews are coming in, publishing just some selected customer reviews? Yeah, I think you should always look at user generated content on your site. Like if people are leaving swear words or something really yeah. offensive, like that actually, if Google can index that content that counts towards the quality of the content on the page. So you should always look at that. But I do think like it's expected that e-commerce sites have reviews, right? So like you should have reviews. You can get review schema and all the things that Google is really interested in e-commerce sites having. but. And you don't only want to show the good reviews either. Like you do want to show the actual truth about what people feel about your products, but always moderate user generated content just for like quality purposes and make sure that it's not offensive or inappropriate. Great. And we have multiple questions asking. Uh, one is actually asking about your screaming for flight. Others are asking, how do we evaluate the impact of EAT and maybe not just uh, right now but also basically in the future or historically do you, do you have some metrics that we can actually check like what what other tools would you recommend if there are any other tools to uh to to, to measure this somehow yeah that's the tricky thing there's no score there's no like da score right everybody wants an eat score so what you have to do is come up with your own score. Like there's a few ways that you can do this. One easy way to do it is to take Google's questions about content quality, which you can get from, uh, there's a, an article called what site owners should know about core updates. They have a variety of different questions that they ask. Um, with the helpful content update, Google has a variety of different questions that it asks. You can put all those questions into a spreadsheet and you can basically like maybe assign a score from one to 10 of how well the content meets these different questions Google's asking, and then you can create a score. So like you can come up with your own system for how to score things internally, but there's no formal official way to do it. There's no tool that does it. And this is what's really complicated about EAT is it's like, it's subjective. There's not one single way to analyze it. So you should work with your team to actually say like, are we providing a good trustworthy authoritative experience and maybe figure out your own scoring system that you use for that. Right, and um, maybe another question about brands that uh, get lots of negative uh, news, for example, some financial services, uh, wealth, asset management, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, what, yeah. is, what is the number one recommendation you would have for them? Also maybe short-term versus long-term, like what kind of content they should be focusing on, anything like this? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of more of a PR like question, right? Like, how do you manage crises or, or you know, brand um, reputation, right? Like, you know, I've had companies come to us over the years who had a really big brand crisis and wanted us to just make it go away with SEO. And it's like, there's some things you can't make go away. So I would listen to your users in those situations and see if there's a way that you can provide your own statement about what people are saying about you, respond to reviews, um, you know, look at, there's all kinds of different tools and, and companies that help with reputation, you know, management, but you have to take all those steps. And then, you know, you should probably also do a lot of the things that we talked about today at the same time. So like, if there's a real expert that works at your company who work on building out that expert's reputation and showing them as a good person to try to mitigate the bad reviews. Right, right. And... I think I think that's all of our questions. And uh, let me remind you that we'll be both sharing the recording of this session on our YouTube channel, Basta Digital. Just search for Basta Digital on YouTube. 
And I think we'll be also providing the presentation, although I'm not sure sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Is that okay with you? Yeah, we can share it. Yeah, okay. So we'll share it as well. So we will get the access to all the slides. You can go and check the Screaming Frog slide. And anything else you want to mention that maybe based on the questions, any further recommendations? No, I think that the nice thing about these conversations is that there's no downside. Like, you know, Google's very focused on this. It's a good strategy for your brand in general. So like, I would always do all these things no matter what happens with algorithm updates and everything, because it's only going to get you a better user experience. So, and it takes a long time as well. So the earlier you can get started on these types of strategies, the better your site will do for the long run. Well, thank you, Lily. We, we can conclude with, with this and uh, thank you again. Thank you everyone for participating, participating. Thank you, Lily, for joining us and have a nice day because I think you are six hours behind. <laughs> so you have still full day. Yes. Uh, you can work on that article that you mentioned. And exactly. <laughs> good luck. <laughs> and thank you again, uh, everybody, for joining. And uh, you can also find some older sessions of SEOs RAS with Rand Fishkin, Bill Slavsky, and other guests on our YouTube channel. And we have also had some sessions, for example, on connecting SEO and analytics and so on. So uh, if you are interested, you'll find it there. And we'll post this recording in about two weeks on YouTube. So thank you again, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks.